So, this year's Phillips Wheel, I would say is a um, fellow New Yorker. Um, I would say I'm a huge fan. I would say um, I should have probably written some notes because I could probably go on for way too long. Um, this year's speaker uh, is, I consider, a giant in his own right. Uh, not only in the Mac community, but in the maker community. Um, is always sort of... Um, it's, uh, it's always amazing to see how much he can dig into and how much he can make. Um, and I think the most important thing to me about that is that then he turns around and shares all this knowledge, either through open source or writing articles. Um, and we're going to hear more about that right now. Please give a huge welcome to Tremblance. Okay, thanks so much for the kind intro. Right? So, I'm really happy to be here at Mac Tech to talk about one of my favorite things, just taking things apart and learning from them, and also tying it into my other hobby of retrocomputing, or as I like to call it, digital archaeology. So, in the beginning, there were dip switches. The computers had front panels with toggle switches, and when you powered them on, you had to uh, flip switches to get the machine to boot. Uh, this worked on things like the Altair, the early uh, home computer, and also on uh, larger systems like the uh, uh, like the uh, PDP-8 mini computer. The PDP-8 at least had core memory, so you could uh, hopefully your program would still be resident when you came back to it. Later uh, mini computers like the PDP-1134 at my office. Uh, got a little bit fancier, and they have optical keypads where you can type in your program. But it's still, you have to type these instructions in every time you want to boot up the machine. And that doesn't really work well for you know, the, the home computer market. Um, so when uh, they started trying to roll this out more generally, they added ROM cards that had these four small chips in it that contained just those instructions necessary to get the system booted. And during the, the microcomputer revolution, all of these computers shipped with basic and uh, built-in and video drivers uh, to display on the television. And this required larger ROM chips, uh, typically uh, the real motherboard in sockets, because these were programmed at the factory uh, via the exposure masks uh, for, the, uh, for the silicon dyes. So the only way to upgrade these was to pull the chips out and swap them. The nice thing about having them socketed is that makes them easy to remove out so that we can read them. And because I do a lot of this sort of stuff as a hobby, uh, I've built an open source tool that allows you to read a variety of ROMs, both from computers and arcade machines. Uh, these tend to be uh, parallel ROMs, which means they output eight data bits simultaneously. And in this case, they have 13 address bits, so they can read uh, 2 to 13 or 8 uh, kilobytes of data on this one chip. Uh, with these parallel ROMs, you can get a good estimate of how much storage just by the number of pins that the chip has. In addition to the uh, basic and the, uh, the other code, these ROMs often contain things uh, like the fonts that are being used for display. On the Commodore 64, the default output device was a television, so the font's actually pretty, pretty chunky because it has to uh, be visible on a low-resolution screen. There's also a really clever trick they're doing for why they have the inverse video, but Commodore 64 trivia could be a, a whole other uh, talk. Other home computers of that era, uh, like the Apple II, were much more expandable. And a lot of users installed a 80 column card that allowed them to run a higher res display. And the ROM on that card has a, a much finer font, it's a little bit easier to read. Although for, uh, in my opinion, 
the character generator on the DEC VT100 uh, was one of the, the nicest fonts of that era. It was both upper and lower case, even though a lot of the systems that, uh, that you might connect your VT100 to, such as this RT11 machine, didn't support mixed case. Uh, my preference for this font probably comes from spending too many hours staring at these terminals, but I do think it's uh, one, of, one of the more beautiful bitmap fonts uh, of that era. The other place where these ROMs were used is for historic programs. Uh, a lot of them were uh, reprogrammable with uh, UV light, so these ROMs have uh, quartz windows cut into the package where you can expose a strong UV light and flip the bits uh, back to an unprogrammed state. And then with a high voltage programmer, you can uh, program new code into them. So these were really popular for, as a way to store programs, especially ones that you don't want to have to toggle in every time. They were also used in things like musical instruments. The Oberheim uh, DX synth used them to store the uh, samples. And it's pretty easy to pull these out, use the same tools that we use to read the computer programs, and we can reconstruct the audio samples. So if you really want that retro sound, it's quite fun to actually pull it from the real machine. The downside to the UV chips is that they suffer from bit rot, that if uh, UV light gets in, and there's always a little bit of UV around, they can actually lose their data. So it's really important to, uh, to preserve them. One of the stories I want to tell you today is about something that I found in a slightly more modern Apple system, this compact Mac SE that I found on the side of the road in Brooklyn and put it on my bike and carried it to my a local hackerspace, NYC Resistor, to see what we scored. It was really exciting to plug it in and to see the, uh, the classic checkerboard come up with the uh, insert floppy disk uh, icon. Um, but unfortunately, the floppy disk drive was broken and the SCSI hard drive wouldn't power on. So it's pretty obvious why the previous owner had abandoned it. With most of these projects, I like to pull them apart and see what's inside. Um, and this is a beautiful example of 1980s uh, through-hole component manufacturing. It's really easy to work on. It's really easy to see what goes into the system. So if we zoom in on the center of the motherboard, we, we can see the Motorola 68K uh, CPU. It runs at about 7.8 megahertz, not, not the fastest uh, machine out there. There's also a, a second CPU on this motherboard, the integrated WAS machine that was a custom processor designed by Apple co-founder, uh, Steve Wozniak. Um, this is, was responsible for doing a lot of the I.O. Uh, programming. It wasn't, didn't run user code. And the other two chips on here are uh, two 8-bit uh, mask ROMs. They are connected to the same uh, 17 uh, address lines of the 68K's 23-bit uh, address bus. And because the 68K was a word-addressable machine, every time it did a read, it would uh, read 16 bits. So it had 8 bits from one ROM and 8 bits from the other ROM. As you can see, these chips are socketed. So uh, I pulled them off and put them in my ROM reader. Um, and if you don't want to disassemble your classic Mac, Jason Scott has posted uh, a lot of these ROM images on the Internet Archive, and you can uh, download them for emulation. Uh, Apple had made a few modifications to these dies, so I had to uh, add a patch to my ROM reader, but it's pretty straightforward to map uh, the pen out for it. Now, and once I had that dump out of the ROMs, I switched to the XXD tool, which is a hex dumper that you probably already have on your Mac uh, if you open the um, uh, terminal application. And usually what I'm looking for when I hex dump these things is just to make sure that it's not all zero or all F, which really indicates some sort of uh, electrical problem. But this one ended with this really long string and that date. And that was really eye-catching. 
Uh, it clearly is not 68K code. It's there's some clearly some sort of message uh, from uh, 31 years ago, almost exactly 31 years ago. I posted about this on the NYC Resistor blog, and Al Costello uh, of BizSavers.org, who is a uh, Apple employee from 86 to 2005, uh, helped fill in the mystery that these are a bunch of the people who worked the initials of uh, team members who worked on, on the Mac SC uh, at Apple. This is a really fun way for them to uh, uh, memorialize themselves um, in, in, in the machine. Uh, and it's just pretty typical of a lot of the Easter eggs you find. Little, there's usually a few bytes left over at the end of the ROMs, so people like to put little things like this in there. Another way to look at the ROMs is to turn, turn it into a bitmap. And uh, I haven't found any really good tools for doing this, so I've written uh, one of my own that uh, it's open source and you can get it from the same place as the ROM reader. It allows you to specify the width of the uh, stride through the ROM, in this case 16 bits since the Mac was a 16 bit machine. And it gives us this uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, visual noise. It's rather hard to see at this resolution, but we can see there's a repeating pattern at the end. That's the, uh, those initials. We can also see some of the uh, things like various GUI elements that are stored in the map, um, things like the window decorations. Uh, we can see some of uh, Susan Kerr's work, uh, these, these bitmap icons that are displayed when the system starts up, along with their uh, transparency masks so that they uh, have an alpha channel over the uh, checkerboard background. There's also a really fun Easter egg uh, that you can't see at this zoom level. But if we zoom in on it, we find a uh, message. Uh, th this is a message from Steve Jobs himself uh, to, to people who might clone the, uh, the, the Macintosh. According to uh, Andy Hertzfeld of uh, Folklore.org, uh, Jobs was very frustrated that the Apple II clones uh, evolved uh, lengthy court cases to try to prove that the cloners had copied the Apple, uh, the Apple II ROMs. So Jobs' plan was to uh, put this in the Apple, in the Mac, and when they got to the courtroom, to be able to hit a, se a secret key sequence and make the clone display this message that it was running code that had been stolen from an Apple computer. According to Hertzfeld, uh, this was never actually tested in court, but there's a rumor that every Mac uh, has some Easter egg like this built into it. Um, but this one is fairly easy to find because it's stored as a, as a bitmap. Apparently they made it more and more difficult. So if we go back to that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, static image, um, eventually if you spend a lot of time looking at these ROMs, which I do, uh, you start to just recognize things, like, well, oh, that's probably a, uh, a jump table, and this is probably some sort of lookup table. But this region uh, here looked visually very different from the rest of it. It didn't look like code, it didn't look like uh, the small GUI elements, and there are these four kind of vertical uh, bars that lined up at some offset that were also intriguing. So I went back to my, my bitmap tool and kind of tried to eyeball what the spacing was on those bars and decided I'd start with a round number. And when plotted at that width, there's something you know, tantalizingly, almost like an analog signal, it looks like, in, in that region. So I tweaked the stride parameter a little bit, trying to you know, 520 or 530, and something started to appear. And when I got to 536 uh, bits across, there was this image uh, that, you know, of people. And a lot of people had documented that there was an Easter egg in the Mac SC that you could hit a keyboard sequence to, um, uh, to make it show up. But it was really electrifying to see these faces suddenly appear, you know, in the wrong uh, dump that I had just made. So I really wanted to figure out how were they stored, well, and how could I unglitch them to, to the, uh, the original smack. So I went back to 
tool. So I went back to uh, XXD and my old friend and uh, looked at the start of each of them. And there's a string pack that was very intriguing. Um, but I couldn't find any file formats that corresponded to that. So I went back to uh, the rumor about how to display uh, the Easter egg uh, on a real hardware. And it said that you hit the programmer button and you type this key sequence. Now the programmer button is a really neat feature of these old Macs. It's this little button hidden inside the cooling grill that if you hit it, it pops up a assembly debugger and lets you inspect memory and uh, interact with the system at a very low level. So given that address that uh, we're supposed to jump to, I then disassemble the, uh, the ROM with the object dump. But if you have Xcode installed, you probably have uh, this, this tool already on your machine. In this case, we have to tell it that we have 68,000. We have to tell it that uh, the loading address and uh, we tell it we're going to disassemble everything. And then uh, I jumped to the, that address, the uh, 41D89A, and did what uh, reverse engineers do. I tried to decompile it a little bit. And I found this section over here was doing a loop over uh, the image data uh, in the ROM. It was issuing an illegal instruction. Uh, this is not a valid um, uh, 68K instruction. And consulting the Mac Almanac, uh, I found that uh, this was used as sort of like a system call to be able to call functions in the ROM. And uh, A8D0 is one called Unpack Bits. Which of the best reverse engineering tool is the internet search engines. You know, literally, I typed Unpack Bits Macintosh and uh, got a bunch of hits. If you watch my CCC talk on Thunderstrike, uh, I spend most of the time saying, all I did is I typed this into Google, or I typed this into uh, DuckDuckGo, and I found stuff. In this case, uh, the search turned up a Apple technical note on the PackBits format, which they say is for the terminally curious, which I think describes probably most of us in this room. <laughs> they also warn us that this information is subject to change, but I hope that the format's pretty stable since this hasn't been updated since 1996. <laughs> so, armed with the, uh, the specification for PackBits, um, I was able to decompress the images and uh, see the, the team who had worked on the Mac SE back at Apple. Uh, I posted this online on the Resistor blog, and Brian McGee uh, sent me a, an email uh, with some background. He was the engineer at Apple who put these photos in. And you might notice that he looks a little different than everyone else, that the exposure is a little off or something. And it turns out he wasn't in the office the day that they took this photo. So after, they, after he scanned it in, he Mac painted himself into it. <laughs> This is a really amazing Easter egg. It occupies over a quarter of the ROM. You know, most Easter eggs are just short text messages. And this is really neat to get to see uh, so many people who worked on this machine. And when Apple was working on the first Mac, they only had 64K of ROM space, and that was not enough. So for the SE, they quadrupled it. And it turns out that was too much. So they had all the space left over. And the team uh, decided to, uh, to put themselves in there. And it's a really a fun legacy uh, for them. You know, now, 31 years later, we get to see uh, the people who worked on, on this machine. And a lot of them have written uh, comments on the Resistor blog post, and it's really great to hear from them. That, you know, and they're so glad that, uh, that we found them. So that's, that's a really fun hobby. But how does it apply to you know, more modern systems? Um, it turns out that we can use these same tools and these same techniques on you know, much more recent uh, uh, Apple machines. Um, my firm wanted to deploy uh, MacBooks, and I wanted to see if, it's possible, if it was possible to project them against some 
uh, some boot time security issues that have been published. And so step one was to open it up and uh, investigate the ROM. The, these ROMs are significantly higher density. Uh, this is 8 megs, and they go up to about 64 megs. Uh, they're serial rather than parallels. They have a lot fewer pins. And they're soldered to the motherboard. And that's because these are uh, flash ROMs. They can be reprogrammed from software. So Apple can push out an update to fix uh, bugs or vulnerabilities. The concern is if an attacker can put, uh, write an update into the ROM, they are in a position to uh, have persistence that could um, stay there even after you reinstall the OS or even after you swap out the hard drive. And because these ROMs run so much earlier than the OS, they're in a position to bypass all of the OS security uh, measures. As a quick proof of concept, I wrote a keylogger that intercepts the file ball password uh, that's being typed in. Um, I did change my password after showing the slide to uh, a few thousand people. And uh, you know, that's the sort of thing that a uh, an actual attacker could exfiltrate and then be able to decrypt the drive later. In order to do this sort of experimentation, I had to build a new uh, ROM reader and writer. And again, this is an open source tool built with a, uh, a TNC microcontroller and a chip clip that allows uh, the, um, the microcontroller to be connected to all eight pins on the ROM. Um, if you do uh, want to build one, there's a, a link there for it. Uh, please disconnect the battery when you're uh, connected and disconnecting it. You don't want different voltages on these rails. It can cause bad things to happen on your, on your machine. What I found while I was doing this reverse engineering was that the Thunderbolt port was a uh, much larger security risk than was uh, previously known. Um, in 2013, uh, Snare presented at Black Hat uh, his research into option ROMs on Thunderbolt devices. He found that uh, these were run, uh, loaded by uh, Apple's firmware and executed prior to the OS. What I found is that option ROMs uh, could uh, circumvent the firmware update process and write, the, write uh, payloads into uh, the boot ROM on the motherboard, which is exactly what the concern was. That if, if an attacker can, can modify the boot ROM, they have uh, total control of the machine. So we, we call this the Thunderstrike vulnerability, and I presented it at uh, CCC in Hamburg a few years ago. And uh, prior to the presentation, uh, I worked with Apple to uh, responsibly disclose it and ensure that there were patches available so that they could uh, protect the machines against it. And that sort of responsible disclosure is really one of the, the, the key things that makes uh, reverse engineering you know, a helpful uh, moving to society. That by finding problems and working with vendors, we're able to help make everyone's machines safer. Coincidentally, at the same conference, uh, Rafal Bush and Corey Kallenberg presented uh, something they called the Dark Jedi attack uh, against PCs. And based on what I knew about uh, the Mac ROMs from my Thunderstrike work, I thought this would probably be portable over to uh, the MacBooks as well. I teamed up with uh, Zeno, Koha, and Corey Kallenberg, and we were able to port Dark Jedi over to the Mac, and we were able to demonstrate uh, a software attack that could rewrite the boot ROM. Uh, we packaged up our proof of concept up as a uh, cute cat screensaver uh, so that folks would uh, want to download it and play with it. And it was able to then use a local privilege es escalation to be able to get access to write uh, it to be able to into that boot ROM. We presented this at uh, DEF CON and Black Hat. Uh, and of course, we worked with Apple to ensure that they had patches available uh, long before we actually gave our presentation. Um, Apple was really uh, very impressed with uh, Zeno and Corey and ended up hiring them to come work on the firmware team inside of Apple. So they have been uh, working on improving uh, the security of, of all of their laptops 
uh, most recently. They've released something with High Sierra that attempts to validate the firmware on, on the main board and attempt to detect uh, malicious or accidental uh, changes to it. And that's now live uh, in, in High Sierra. If this sort of firmware security interests you, uh, tomorrow Duo is giving a talk here at MacTech uh, on uh, Apple EFI firmware. Um, and I highly recommend you check that out. Apple, Apple is also trying to engage with the security community to encourage more of this responsible disclosure. Uh, they have a bug bounty program uh, that not only handsomely rewards uh, folks for finding firmware vulnerabilities, it's unique among these bug bounties in that it grants security researchers a uh, uh, reverse engineering rights on the hardware that typically when you have an end user license agreement it says you're not allowed to reverse engineer things. Um, but Apple is saying if you're, if you're helping them, they want you to reverse engineer it. They want you to take it apart. And Apple is not really, uh, you know, is no stranger to having people take their machines apart. That the original machines shipped with full schematics so that uh, you could understand how the machines worked. In fact, they expected pretty much everyone who bought one of these machines to install cards and build expansions for them. Um, last year at uh, the Vintage Computing Festival East, Daniel Koke, uh, employee number 12 at Apple, uh, showed us his Mac 12 schematic, which fit on a single page and is laid out pretty much exactly the same as the motherboard. This is marvelous. If you are doing uh, any sort of service or maintenance on the machine, having these sorts of resources were just really uh, useful to be able to make sense of how they worked. These days, if you want to look at Apple schematics, you need to go to Shenzhen, China, to the electronics market. And you can find the schematics. They no longer fit on a single page. They're now uh, fairly large books of uh, you know, very small surface mount components. And the drive to miniaturization has made it much more difficult to do uh, modifications on the hardware. It's not impossible, as uh, folks like Scotty Allen have demonstrated. Uh, he was disappointed that the iPhone 7 didn't have a headphone jack, so he reverse engineered the Apple Lightning uh, adapter and built it into his iPhone 7 and had the courage to mill out a headphone uh, jack so that he can plug his headphones directly in. That sort of engineering heroics is probably not for everyone, but it's still possible to, uh, to repair a lot of these, uh, these sort of macro scale components. Um, uh, iFixit, which was started by uh, previous Mac Tech speaker Kyle uh, Weens, is basically crowdsourcing a service and maintenance manual uh, for pretty much all of the consumer electronic devices. And they have really great guides for how do you replace the parts that break uh, frequently. Um, and this is something that is really useful if you are maintaining a fleet of these machines to be able to do these things in-house. Um, you know, I think probably everyone has broken an uh, iPhone screen at some point, and they have kits and instructions to walk you through how to, uh, with just simple hand tools, pull it apart and replace it. Although, just because you can uh, replace the screen and repair your devices doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be able to do so. That with uh, the iPhone 6, Apple pushed a iOS update out that uh, bricked phones where the screen and fingerprint sensor had been replaced by a non-official uh, repair facility. They eventually rolled this back, but there is a significant security concern uh, because of the way the Touch ID and the Secure Enclave uh, bonding works. This isn't a, a, a new fight uh, between users and, and vendors. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, auto manufacturers w would deny warranty claims if any non-company uh, um, repair facility had worked on the vehicle. Congress passed a law saying that uh, everyone has the right to repair their own automobiles. 
And there's groups like Repair.org that are working today to try to get legislation passed. They currently have uh, bills up in uh, 12 states to ensure that, uh, that you can repair devices, that you can get the service information that you need and you can share it with others, and that you can modify the devices to do what you want them to do. Because the freedom to tinker is something that I think as programmers and as engineers and as computer users, we really uh, cherish that this is you know, what makes these things useful for us. Unfortunately, there, the DMCA uh, forbids a lot of the sort of reverse engineering uh, of devices. And groups like the EFF and other civil liberties uh, groups file petitions every uh, three years with the Librarian of Congress for exemptions. The good news is that in 2016, uh, they received a, uh, a somewhat limited uh, but fairly uh, useful exemption to allow security, uh, reverse engineering for security research on, on consumer devices. And when we talk about reverse engineering, you know, a lot of the examples are from the security space, but it's actually, it's a lot bigger than that. That reverse engineering is how we understand uh, the world around us. That, you know, the scientific method has always been about making observations of the natural world and then trying to make predictions based on that to try to understand how things work. You know, we've, we've learned through taking things apart and sharing that knowledge with, with others. And when you have complex systems, the best way to understand them is to be able to pull them apart and see how all of these pieces go together. And now that basically the entire world is digital, it's really important that we have the ability and the know-how to take apart our hardware and our software and be able to make it work the way we want it to work, to be able to repair it, and to be able to uh, tell other people how to do it. So, so I really hope that the, uh, the, the folks at Apple uh, who put their images into the, into the ROMs 31 years ago you know, are, are pleased how much they've inspired uh, me and other reverse engineers and digital archaeologists with their with their image, and I, I hope that they've inspired you a little bit as well. Um, I really want to thank MacTech for inviting me to come talk about my favorite hobby. Uh, if you're interested in further information, here's a bunch of links. Um, the slides are also available if you want to uh, check them out. Um, and I think we have a few minutes for questions, so I'd love to uh, uh, chat with you further about these things. Yeah, it was right after Thunderstrike right 1. After Thunderstrike, and he came and spoke to a room of Mac admins about Thunderstrike, and people, like, I don't think they knew what to say. Like, they had no idea that you could plug in a device to a Mac, and it would be owned forever in perpetuity. If anyone needs to borrow a Thunderbolt Ethernet adapter, I have a few with me. <laughs> Uh, I, I did. Uh, a lot of them wrote to say, hey, that's me. Um, and uh, again, Al Kauso from BitSavers uh, helped uh, identify several of them. There are a few question marks still there. Um, I'll update the slides to uh, annotate uh, the, the individuals. It's the great part about the internet is uh, that you know, people find out about these things and, and write you about them.
this, this microphone's better. So I'll get back over there. If um, you didn't grow up poking around in assembly on all these older systems, what would you suggest to start learning these things? Do the capture the flag. That it's, capture the flags are basically uh, for these sorts of puzzles, but in a fun way, and usually with more modern tools. Um, there, there are even some that specifically focus on assembly or reverse engineering, and those are great ways to, uh, to learn about it. Find a team, somebody, and uh, find a mentor. All right, someone else had a question there. Make me work for it. Hi, I spent um, two months this summer tackling a bug in High Sierra that turned out to be a function of the fact that High Sierra um, has a sort of memory protection for DMA. Um, and I assume, so, so the way it works out is that if you, if you DMA to a place that the kernel doesn't think you should DMA, it causes a, a, a machine exception that at the current, in the default state maps to just nothing happening. So you actually don't know anything's going wrong except that you know, your driver doesn't work. Um, so I'm assuming that my, nobody's ever said this, but I'm assuming this is put in as a way of mitigating future uh, vulnerabilities like Thunderstrike. So the IOMMU is used for disabling a lot of those DMA ranges. Um, it's worth checking out the work that uh, Ulf and I can't remember his collaborator's name are doing with a, a tool called PCI Leech that is probing the uh, weaknesses of the IOMMU. Um, there was going to be a Thunderstrike 3 talk that never actually came to fruition uh, that was looking at uh, ways to bypass the IOMMU with malicious hardware. Uh, the good news is uh, Apple appears to be configuring the IOMMU correctly mm -hmm. to prevent spoofed uh, TLP packets, which uh, very few other vendors are doing, in my experience. I knew I was asking the right person. All right, I think we have time for maybe one more. Adam, you raising your hand? Okay. Not, not so much a question, but uh, I just wanted to share in 2002, the Mac Hack Conference, um, there was a wonderful hack that won at, called Firestarter that was an app um, that uh, created a quick time burning flame effect on a Mac and then propagated it to any Mac that you plugged in via Firewire. So there were some pretty impressive things that had been done in the past as well with hacking things. That again, you would not expect this would be in any way possible through, uh, through normal means. Yeah, the Firewire, you, yeah, Firewire had uh, some difficult properties r r with regards to um, uh, DMA. Uh, it, it at least required a kernel driver to enable it, so it was easier to turn off than uh, the Thunderbolt uh, PCIe uh, DMA which is now requiring special hardware. All right. Oh, uh, I can't turn down Papayan on a question. Just a real quick question. Um, so there's a lot of upheaval right now about Intel management engine being probably really bad to have around, <laughs> but it's everywhere. Does, I'm, I'm, I've been trying to understand whether this is an actual issue or if a Apple just turns that off entirely, like even in sleep mode, it, it cannot be used. So Apple uses a greatly reduced size management engine uh, firmware that does not have the AMT modules. Uh, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have other issues, but it at least eliminates a lot of the, uh, the network ones. Um, I haven't looked specifically at uh, any of the recent uh, Mac uh, management engine firmwares, um, but I have done some work in reducing the, uh, the, the exposure of the, the management engine. Um, and I know that there are people at Apple who are also looking into that. That is an interesting one. A Apple is using the management engine though, I think, right? They're pumping a bunch of things through it, like uh, I think last time I looked, some video goes through there. So right? there's a, the protected video path uh, goes through the management engine and um, I'm, 
I'm not super familiar with how Apple is using that, but I know that there are uh, plugins that will talk to Netflix and other video services yeah. and the do, do the decryption and the attestation via the management engine and then hand the packets directly <laughs> off to the GPU for, uh, for display. It's a, it's a really uh, extensive amount of infrastructure just to support uh, uh, DRM video. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you've ever wondered why you can't take screenshots of Netflix, it's on my screen. It doesn't come out. It's because Apple's doing some DRM trickery. Uh, okay, so I think I have one question before we wrap up. So you found an OBX synth in the trash. You found a Mac SE in the trash. Where do you live that you find all this great <laughs> stuff? <laughs> It's surprising uh, how much interesting stuff gets thrown out. There's, there's sort of a curve, I think, where um, uh, a lot of the things from the, the mid-80s are not old enough to be exotic and not new enough to be interesting. Um, <laughs> so you have uh, you know, Model M keyboards, occasionally Nexts. Um, i trying to think what else we found recently. The PDP-11 was a, a cast-off. Wow. Uh, the Altair was uh, at a garage sale. You know, it's, it's surprising how much people uh, just want to clean out their basements. <laughs> all right. Once again, thank you so much, Trammell. All right. Thank you all.